clap your hands and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We praise God for our musicians. We praise, praise the name of the Lord. He is worthy. He is worthy to be praised. I am. If you would turn with me to our scripture for today, the fourth chapter of Matthew. Matthew, the fourth chapter, verses 18 through 25. Matthew 4, 18 through 25. I praise God this morning. We were blessed. Um, oh, that's new. We were blessed by um, we were blessed by a guest preacher this morning, very dear friend of mine, Reverend Dr. William Campbell uh, from Colleen, Texas. Uh, I found out today, I did not know this, Colleen is where Fort Hood is, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, in Texas. And um, he is there pastoring our sister church, Anderson Chapel AME. He blessed us with a word this morning and talked about, I can't land yet, and eagle soaring, and Isaiah, and it was wonderful. And while he was preaching, I was shouting, and I had a great time. But it also let me know, when I'm not preaching, I miss preaching. I miss it. So I'm so glad to be standing here with you before you today, for it's a blessing just to be able to uh, relate what God has laid upon your heart to God's people. Fourth chapter of Matthew, 18 to 25. And I thank you for sitting around and bearing with me long enough for me to be able to relate what it is that God has for me to relate. Fourth chapter of Matthew, verses 18 through 25. We find these words reading from the New Living Translation of the Bible. One day Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fish for a living. Jesus called out to them, come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to come too, and they immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. News about him spread as far as Syria, and people soon began bringing to him all who were sick. And whatever their sickness or their disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. Large crowds followed him wherever he went, people from Galilee, the ten towns, Jerusalem, from all over Judea. And from east of the Jordan River, crowds followed Jesus. For a few moments today as we celebrate the goodness of God, as we continue our series, uh, Mission Possible, uh, I ask that you would consider this subject with me. It is possible to have absolute faith. It is possible to have absolute faith. We are now in the midst of the season of Lent, commemorating the 40 days prior to Easter, or we like to call it Resurrection Sunday, where we celebrate our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. During the season of Lent, we pay tribute to, we highlight, we praise God for the ministry of Christ Jesus. And when we hear the words, Mission Impossible, we are reminded of a, possible t of a, of a popular television show, a string of hit movies, and a phrase that is uttered any time something is accomplished that's seemingly impossible. Anytime someone expects you to fail at what you're trying to do, they're gonna say to you, that's mission impossible. Anytime you get ready to do something and you think in your mind, I want to do this, I believe I can do this, but what I'm doing is hard, it's difficult, it's, it's trying, it's frustrating, that's mission impossible. In fact, if we look at the mission of Christ Jesus, who came to the world to save us and came to the world to give his life so we would have life everlasting. Look at the challenges of his mission, the problems in his mission, the persecution in his mission. You would say to yourself, that's mission impossible. However, because Jesus is who he is, he's the son of God, the prince of peace, the Messiah, my everything, my will in the middle of the wheel, Mary's baby child, bright morning star, we go down the list. His mission is not mission impossible. Jesus teaches us that that which looks impossible to us is extremely and entirely possible to God. And because Jesus teaches us that a mission that seems impossible is really possible, he also teaches us that we can do all things through him so he makes every mission possible. We began last week um, with the sermon series and we talked about in our first installment how it is possible to say no. 
We look at the fourth chapter of Luke, which is the temptation account of Jesus Christ according to Luke. And it's funny, today we're right behind that, but we're behind Matthew's temptation account, not Luke's temptation account. And, and we learn here that Jesus teaches us when he's tempted by the devil three times, we, we learn that even when we are tempted to say yes. Now, Jesus wasn't tempted to say yes. I don't believe in any part of my body that there was anything about Jesus that even considered or contemplated saying yes to the devil. But we ain't Jesus. Come on, somebody. So while Jesus was not tempted to say yes, uh, we are not Jesus, and we have our temptations to deal with. And he teaches us that even when we want to say yes, if yes is not in the word and the will and the way of God, we must say no. And it is possible to say no when we align ourselves with God's word, God's will, and God's way. And today we're going to pick up with our second installment, and we're going to pick up right after the temptation account of Jesus, but not according to Luke. We're looking at the one according to Matthew. As we come up with this title today, it is possible to have absolute faith. What is faith? Um, get your Bible out. You know, faith is the substance of things hoped for while being the evidence of things not seen. That's Hebrews. Faith is what we walk by, especially when we can't see. That's 2 Corinthians. Faith is what allowed the ancestors to do all the marvelous things they did. And there's a roll call there. That's right back in Hebrews again. This is what faith is. Faith is essential to Christians. And as Christians, I believe that we must have what I like to call absolute faith, a faith that cannot be deterred no matter what. In fact, absolute faith is reserved for God and God alone, as our faith in God must be so absolute that there's no way it can ever be changed. One of the things I had to come to as I grow older, and I'm sure you had to come to as you grow older, uh, when I was younger, I used to really try to have faith in people. When I was younger, I used to try my best to have faith in people. And I really, really, really wanted to have faith in people. But the older I got, the more I realized that you cannot put your absolute faith in people. And I say that not as an indictment against people, because you cannot put your absolute faith in me. So I don't say that as an indictment, but I say that there are some things that are reserved for God and God alone. Some places that only belong to God, some things that only belong to God, some things that only have God's name on them. And one of those is absolute faith. So in our text today, shortly, we pick up shortly after Jesus has been tempted by the devil for 40 days, 40 nights. He's beginning his earthly ministry. As Jesus begins his ministry, he is preaching for all to repent and turn to God, and the kingdom of God will be theirs if they just repent and turn to God, and he meets up with his first disciples. The Bible says he meets Simon, Peter, and Andrew first, and they were fishing because they were fishermen. It was their job. It was what they did. And upon calling them, they immediately left what they were doing and went to be with Jesus. Next, Jesus meets James and John, who were also fishing, and they were fishing with their father, Zebedee. And they also, being fishermen, were repairing their nets with their father, Zebedee. And the Bible says Jesus calls upon them as well, and they left their father immediately to follow Jesus. Then as they begin to follow Jesus, the Bible said word spread about Jesus, and people began to know Jesus for themselves. And all over, he was healing all manner of diseases and illnesses, all the way from demon possession to epilepsy, to those who were paralyzed, to those who were lame, to those who were blind, to those who were deaf. And everyone who came to him was able to be healed. And the crowd got larger and larger and larger as they brought all manner of people to Jesus to be healed. And the Bible says the crowd followed Jesus. Brothers and sisters, when we look at this story closer, I believe we're giving a better understanding of absolute faith and how it is possible for us as Christians to have absolute faith, but not absolute faith in our brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or husbands or wives or children, not even in ourselves, but to have absolute faith in God through the person of Christ Jesus. So during this Lenten season, for a few minutes, if you just uh, uh, walk with me for a minute, we're going to talk about how it is possible to have absolute faith. Three things God teaches us about absolute faith today. Here's the first. 
absolute faith teaches us is sometimes we have to leave what we are used to doing. Absolute faith will teach us that sometimes we have to depart from that which we used to do. When we exercise absolute faith in God and we are compelled to follow Jesus, we realize it means I can't do some of the things I used to do. And, and, and that's why we say once we decide to follow Jesus, we can't be what we used to be or do what we used to do. And, and not only do we not do them in following Jesus, we're not afraid of the repercussions or the consequences. Because following Jesus means, to put it plainly, some things we used to do have to be left behind. In the scripture, we find Jesus uh, between the temptation and the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he's on his way to the Sermon on the Mount. He's just finishing up the temptation. And, and he is beginning his earthly ministry as recorded and as, as told to us. He begins, he calls the first of his disciples, Simon, Peter, and Andrew. Uh, Simon Peter, you know, as Peter. And when Jesus encounters them, they are fishing as this was their profession. Jesus says, follow me. And he says, I'm, I, I'll make you fishers of men, if you're fishers of people, if you just follow me. And the Bible says they left what they were doing and immediately followed Jesus. Absolute faith allowed them to stop what they were doing at that moment and follow Jesus. Simon, Peter, and Andrew were brothers and they were fishermen. This was their profession. This was their livelihood. This is what they did best. And, and, and this is what they were good at. If they couldn't do nothing else, they could do this. Everybody in life ought to have something they're good at. You ought to have something you're so good at that you know if you can't do nothing else, you can do that. And so they knew if I can't do anything else, I ought be able to fish. Give me a hook, give me a line, give me, some, uh, uh, give me a rod and reel, and I can make it. It wasn't a rod and reel, probably just a cane pole. But give me a rod and reel, I can make it. I, if I can't do nothing else, I can do this. So they're in the middle of doing what they did best, and along comes Jesus, and they're called to stop doing what they knew they could do best. And they were saying, said by Jesus, they, they, they were told to come and follow me. This must have been scary for Simon, Peter, and Andrew. It must have been daunting for Simon, Peter, and Andrew. They were used to being on the water. Water was home. Fish was good. I, I, I can make it fishing. I, I, I don't know. It was a major decision for them. But because of their absolute faith in God, they stopped what they were doing and went to follow Jesus. The question I have for you is this, brothers and sisters. Is our faith so resolute and so absolute that we're able to stop what we're doing to follow Jesus. And what I love about this text, hear me for a minute. They were fishing and they stopped fishing to follow Jesus. Many times we like to use, uh, when we talk about following Jesus and we're not who we used to be, we say, no, I used to lie, but now I'm following Jesus. I used to cheat, but now I'm following Jesus. I used to steal, but now I'm following Jesus. I used to run around, but now I'm following Jesus. I used to cuss and fuss, but now I'm following Jesus. They used to fish. And now they follow Jesus. Hear me for a minute. I used to cuss. I used to fuss. I used to run around. I used to sin. I used to do this. Used to do that. Used to da 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 da. And now I follow Jesus. They used to fish, and now they follow Jesus. Sometimes what God asks us to stop doing is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just not what we're supposed to be doing. Sometimes we get so caught up in thinking that when Jesus calls us out. He calls us out from a life of sin and, 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 and into a life of righteousness. And yes, he does do that. But there are other times when Jesus doesn't call us necessarily out from a life of sin into a life of righteousness. He just calls us from a life of unfulfillment to a life of fulfillment. From a life of a lack of potential to a life where we realize our full potential. And every now and again, if we're going to have absolute faith in Jesus, even if I'm good at what I'm doing and I like what I'm doing and what I'm doing ain't hurting nobody, Every now and then, we've still got to stop when we're called by Jesus, what we're doing, what we're comfortable with, what we're used to, what's been working for so long, what ain't hurt nobody. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Every now and again, we got to stop and follow Jesus. Question is, this Lenten season, even if you have to stop what you're good at, is your absolute faith strong enough? to tell you to still follow Jesus. Absolute faith teaches us not only 
Do we have to leave sometimes what we're used to doing? But absolute faith teaches us sometimes we have to leave the people we're used to being with. Absolute faith says sometimes I need to stop what I'm doing and follow Jesus. But there are other times when I need to stop hanging around who I'm with and follow Jesus. Plainly put, when I put my absolute faith in Jesus and when I follow Jesus, when we follow Jesus, it's highly likely that we will not just change what we do. It's also going to change the crowd that surrounds us. When we exercise absolute faith in Jesus, get ready for God to give you a brand new crowd to hang around. In the text again, Jesus calls Simon, Peter, and Andrew. Later on, a little bit down the shore, the Bible says he encounters James and John. And, and it's a little bit further down. And when he finds them, they're with their father Zebedee fishing. That was the thing to do back then. And, and they're in the process of repairing their nets with their father, with daddy, with pops, padre, my man, 50 grand, my ace. You know, the one that, you know, looking out for me, daddy. You know, you, I love it when JoJo, last night JoJo came downstairs. I was watching the Duke Carolina game. Yes, Carolina lost. Yes, I'm mad, nevertheless. <laughs> Watching the Duke Carolina, and JoJo sat on the couch, and JoJo said, Daddy, I want to watch this game with you. And that just did my heart so good. And JoJo said, JoJo ain't never watched a basketball game with me a day in his life. He's a football guy. But JoJo sat down and watched the game with me, and, and, and it made me feel so good that my man watched the game with me. And we sat there. He was asking questions about it. It felt good because he wanted to be around Daddy. James and John were with Daddy. They weren't doing nothing big. They were repairing nets. They were in the process of repairing their nets. And, 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 and they're with their father. And Jesus calls them to follow him. When Jesus calls them and says, come now, follow me and be fishers of people, they stop right then fishing with daddy. They stop watching the game with daddy. They stop hanging out with daddy. And the Bible says they go to follow Jesus. They left Simon and Peter what they were used to doing. James and John not only left what they were used to doing, they left who they were used to hanging around. When we look at the story of James and John, they didn't just leave what they were used to doing. They left Daddy, the one they were used to being with. And here's the thing. When we talk about Jesus, once again, we talk about he called me out of darkness into the marvelous light. You know, he, he, he put my foot from sinking sand to steady ground. He picked me up, turned me around, put my feet on solid ground. He made a way out of nowhere. He did that. So we always make it seem like when Jesus calls us out from the crowd we were with to a new crowd, that the crowd we were with before was bad and the new crowd is good. But sometimes it's not about being with a bad crowd. Sometimes you're just with the wrong crowd. And sometimes... The wrong crowd, not being an indictment of morality against them. But sometimes it's just not who you are supposed to be with for that season. So the Bible says that they got up right then and left their father, their dad, their protector, the one that taught them how to fish, the one that taught them to repair a net, the one that taught them how to make a living, the one that taught them the fish to keep and the fish to throw back, the one that taught them the best place to go sell the fish, the one that taught them how to make it when nobody else could make it. And you mean to tell me they left him to go follow Jesus. The best place they could have thought about being was with daddy. But instead, their faith was so absolute, along comes Jesus and they go and follow him. Brothers and sisters, wasn't nothing wrong with Zebedee. He's a good man. And I know he was a good man because when his sons were called away from him, he ain't complained. Try to take Jojo away from me and see what happens. If you say, come on, Jojo, follow me, I'm going to say the heck with you. Jojo, stay right here, buddy. Zebedee ain't do that. He didn't say, stay here with me. He didn't say, be here with me. He understood the necessity of God placing them from the old crowd to a new crowd. And every now and again, church, you got to tell people, when God lifts me to a different place, and when God 
elevates me to a different position. It's not so much that you were doing something wrong. It's not so much that you're a bad person. It's not so much that something's wrong with you. I just can't hang with you no more because I got something different I've got to do. It's not saying you're bad. It's not saying you're wrong. It just means I got to do something different that God calls me to do. And when your faith is so absolute, when your faith is resolute, when your faith is firm, when your faith is strong, when your faith is unwavering, when your faith is unwilting, you're able to say, if Jesus calls, I'll leave mama, I'll leave daddy, I'll leave husband, I'll leave wife, I'll leave kids, I'll leave grandparents, I'll leave everybody I used to hang with, I'll leave my road dogs, I'll leave my crew, I'll leave my homies, I'll leave my aces, I'll leave you because it's time to go and follow Jesus. If James and John were to stay with their old crowd, they would not have been able to have the things that Jesus desired for them with the new crowd. And the question I have for you today is simply this. Is your old crowd holding you back from what Jesus has? Ain't got to be bad. It's not always about bad stuff. It's just about the fact that I have been given a new crowd by Jesus. And if I've got absolute faith, I got to stop doing what I'm doing, stop hanging who I used to hang with. Ain't nothing wrong with you. I still love you. Ain't nothing bad about you. I still love you. But God's got a different place, a different level, and a different uh, 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 altitude for me to aspire to. So I've got to be comfortable leaving who I used to hang around with. Brothers and sisters, absolute faith teaches us to leave behind what we used to do. And sometimes you had to leave behind who you used to be with. And, and here's the last thing absolute faith teaches us. Absolute faith teaches us sometimes you just leave behind everything. Just pick up and leave it all behind. Um, here's what blows my mind. Simon and Peter and Andrew left what they were comfortable doing to follow Jesus. They were fishermen, right? Clearly, they left to follow Jesus. James and John left who they were comfortable being with. They left their father. He didn't complain to follow Jesus. But there's a third group that also exhibited absolute faith. Simon Peter, Andrew, James, John, all exhibited absolute faith. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't they all become disciples? Right? I'm reading my Bible right, right? Simon Peter, Andrew, James, John, all became disciples of Christ, that they were part of his inner circle, his crew, his group. They were part of his clique, for lack of a better word. They were part of his inner circle. They were his people. But, but there was also a larger group with Jesus. Let's just call them the crowd. And we see here that the crowd also followed Jesus. By the time Jesus called his first disciple, Simon Peter, Andrew, James, John, the Bible says large crowds were also following Jesus. And as they followed Jesus, he healed those of, of their infirmities and paralysis and being lame and blind and deaf and all kinds of manner of things. And everybody who was healed was brought to him. Word spread about Jesus, and the more he healed, the more people followed him. Can I preach this for a second? I just got to say one thing. I'm, I'm going to get off track, but I'm going to get back on track. I just want you all to know. If people knew it was healing going on in church, don't you think more folk would come to church? If folk knew it was healing going on in church, that's an, I'm not on my soapbox today, but these preaching reality shows and, 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 and preachers even on television and preaching, preaching, and it's a beautiful thing, it's a wonderful thing, praise God. How many of them talk about the healing that takes place in church? How many of them talk about the broken hearted that walk in with a broken heart but walk out with a healed heart? Walk in with a con broken spirit, walk out with a healed spirit. Walk in not knowing how I'm going to make it, but walk out knowing whatever I do, Christ is going to make it anyhow for me. Walk in with problems and you walk out with the same problems but you walk out with the problems being given to Jesus. You walk in with the burden on your back and walk out with the burden on his back. How many folk would come to church if they knew this was a place of healing? I digress. He followed Jesus. His people were healed. And, 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 and the disciples and the crowd followed Jesus and the crowd got larger and larger. As I prepare to close today, I want to tell you this. Jesus what was on his way to the Sermon on the Mount and, 
and, and the Beatitudes and all that. And the crowd was just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it was going to be huge. But I want us to focus for a moment on this crowd at this moment. The disciples gave up their jobs and their families, but the crowd, the crowd gave up everything. And this is just my theological assertion today, but the disciples were called by Jesus. So Jesus went to the disciples individually and said, Derek, Cornell, Marcus, Brian, y'all come with me. And Derek and Cornell and Marcus and Brian got up and followed Jesus. He ain't call anybody in the crowd by name. Nobody in the crowd was called out. He didn't say, uh, he didn't say, come on, Billy. Come on, Jim. Come on, Bob. He didn't call, come on, Alexander. He didn't call anybody in the crowd by name. So the disciples were called by Jesus by name. Jesus went and found the disciples. The crowd went and found Jesus. And as much as I love the disciples, and I think the disciples are wonderful, and I think the disciples are awesome, if it's up to me, I think it takes even a little bit more faith to realize that even when he didn't call me by name, I'm going to follow him anyhow. Even when he didn't pick me out of a crowd, I'm going to follow him anyhow. Even if he did not point to me specifically, I'm going to follow him anyhow. And every now and again, church, you got to realize I would rather be walking in a crowd with Jesus where my name is not known, but I'm still in the right crowd. Where my name might not be known, but I'm still in the right crowd. I'd rather be poor and broke in a crowd with Jesus than rich and outside of his crowd. And every now and again, you got to realize, even if you feel like you weren't called by name, even if you feel like nobody knows your name, I'm here to tell you, you keep on following him anyhow. Follow him and give it all up. Follow him and let it all go. Follow him and be willing to go wherever he goes. Follow him and have absolute faith. Even if you don't get to sit on the right side or the left side, guess what? So what? You're still in the crowd. Even if I don't get to sit at the feet of his throne, guess what? So what? I'm still in the crowd. Even if my name was not called and my name might not ever be in lights and my name might not ever be elevated, you don't have to know me by Joseph Nathaniel Cousin Sr. You don't have to know me by Reverend. You don't have to know me by doctor. You don't have to know me by pastor. All you got to do is know me as a child of God. I'll blend in. I'll get in where I fit in. I'll go where I got to go. I'm just glad to be in the crowd that's following Jesus. Is there anybody in here today that can shout with me right now because you're not worried about name recognition. You're not worried about who knows your name or who doesn't know your name. You're glad to be with the crowd that's following Jesus. Let us stand. The crowd gave up everything to follow Jesus. They saw what he was able to do. They knew he was the real deal. Even before he healed a soul, I guarantee you they knew who he was. They gave up familiar surroundings, jobs, families, stability, and possessions to follow Jesus. And the question I have for us today is still relevant. Are you willing to exercise absolute faith and give it all up to follow Jesus? The parameters, boundaries of the term giving it up for Jesus it doesn't necessarily mean in 2015 what it meant in these times. Now it is perfectly acceptable and understood to follow Jesus, but you don't have to move. Follow Jesus, you can still drive the same car you're driving. Follow Jesus, you can still probably work in the same job you're working. You have to change some things in the job. You can probably hang out with the same crowd you used to hang with. You may have to cut a couple of them off here and there. The parameters are somewhat different, but the crux of it is still the same. Am I willing to give it all up to follow Jesus? That's absolute faith. One of the things I've always loved, brothers and sisters, I've loved, I can't watch it, but I, but I love the concept of it. I love high wire trapeze acts and high wire acrobats who walk across wires and, and, and I can watch the ones who have nets 
because I know in my heart that if they fall, they're going to be all right because the net's going to catch them. I can't watch the ones that work without a net because I don't want to see what happens if they fall. Matter of fact, I think it was just somebody just not too long ago who broke a world record or something by walking across between two skyscrapers and, and, and did it without in Chicago. And didn't they do it without anything? They did it free? I couldn't watch that. But here's the thing. They don't care if I watch it or not. <laughs> they don't care about that. Because they have the faith to realize and understand that it's going to be done. When you give it all up for Jesus, it's like tightrope walking without a net. At least a net that can be seen. But I guarantee you, the net is there. And if you fall, you might not see the net, but he's still going to catch you. And if it's not meant for you to fall, guess what? You're not going to fall. But either way, when you give it all up for Jesus, he will provide. So now if Reverend Amos and Reverend Connors will come on down with me, brothers and sisters. I, I, I'm not going to stay here, but I got to get back to this whole understanding we have. And this is not a of tithing and giving and being. And, and I think some of the